when you can touch people's lives and really transform their quality of life and liberate them into you know enjoying cash flow or big returns or or getting things like that and open up the doors of freedom uh, there's nothing more rewarding than that so we, we love buying and selling land but more than anything it's really transforming lives so if you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal then you're in the right place on Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, and on today's episode, we're going to be diving deep with my special guest, and he's going to reveal how it is that he's going about raising over $1 million in private money for his real estate deals. Well, he and his wife, they found themselves back in 2016 out of the corporate world, and they were out of jobs, right? They found themselves actually in a crisis moment, out of work, and actually, more importantly, they were out of income. So they had a decision to make. Were they going to go back into the rat race again uh, of corporate or were they going to do something else? Well, they researched many different options um, and they really wanted to live life, you know, on their own terms. They wanted to be entrepreneurs. They wanted the wealth. They wanted the freedom. So what did they do? Well, they ventured into real estate and they found this really, really interesting niche and it's called vacant land flipping. So they went all in. They grew their land business into a life-changing engine of cash flow and financial independence. And what did it do? It fueled their new found life of freedom and control. So we're going to talk with my guests here in just a moment about raising private money for real estate and also about the land flipping business. In just a moment, you're going to meet my special guest. Mr. Mike Deaton, right after this. Well, hello there, Mike, and welcome to the show. Jay, it's great to see you again. Thanks for having me on your show. I'm excited to be yeah. here. Absolutely. I loved being on your show. I mean, I've, I've never been on a podcast that had fight club <laughs> in the name. Of, in fact, I think I sort of sparred against another guest simultaneously. That's right. Yep. Yep. You've been on twice. So you came on solo and then you went head to head with some multifamily syndicators. That's right. <laughs> oh my lands. Um, so Mike, let's go ahead and jump in. We want to talk about raising private money because after all, this is raising private money podcast. Makes and sense. we also want to talk about your, your land business. So what year did you start raising private money? We started raising money um, for multifamily syndications. And that was back in 2020, I would say. We, we got into um, commercial real estate after we'd started our land business. Okay. So you've done the land flipping. You also done commercial real estate. Uh, of course, my focus is single family houses. Mm -hmm. And whether you're raising money, private money for single family houses or you're raising money for commercial deals, it's all the same money. It's just a matter of how are you going, you know, to structure it. It's been my experience, Mike, that most real estate investors that go out to raise capital, there is something that happened in their business that triggered them to start mm -hmm. raising capital. Now, for me, my first six years, 2003 to 2009, that I was investing in real estate, I relied on the banks. They made yeah. the rules, right? I go to the bank, get on my hands and knees, put my hands underneath my chin, beg, plead, sell, persuade. And then all of that changed in January 2009 when I was cut off from the banks. So that's my story in a nutshell. I had to find a better and quicker way to fund my deals and to, and to find funding for it. How is it that you got involved with private money instead of using, you know, institutional money for your uh, commercial deals? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, it was really born out of necessity, similar to you, although not the same situation. So we, um, my wife and I, as you mentioned in the in the intro, we pivoted out of 
a life of corporate and W-2 salaries into earning our own money. And once uh, we built up our primary business, we really decided to get into, into commercial real estate as a way to diversify our income stream, but also to mitigate taxes, right? So we wanted the passive losses and the depreciation that came with commercial real estate. So we initially went in thinking we were going to be owner operators, um, apply some of our skill sets, which were more in running operations, uh, underwriting properties and things like that. And the more we got into it, um, in the multifamily syndication space, which your viewers may or may not be aware of, but it's more of a group of investors getting together to pool their assets to buy a larger asset than they could on their own. And so we're leveraging our dollars to put a down payment down on a $5 million, $10 million, $15 million property. And the bank is providing 80% of the leverage or, you know, in these, in these cases, uh, 60% of the leverage these days. And so the more we got into it, the more we found that the critical piece to really getting these deals across the finish line was bringing money and investors into the deals. Because back in the uh, 2020, it was right around um, COVID was hitting, but there was still a, a flurry of multifamily activity going. And uh, there was just a lot of investment happening and, and it was really a, a need to get money to the table. So we decided to shift gears and also look at raising money to help close these deals and, and get them uh, to the closing table. What are some of your um, what are some of your favorite ways to raise private money, to get the word out, to let people know that you have an opportunity uh, for them to consider and, you know, have better rates of return than they're definitely getting at the local bank. Um, how have you gone about that? We really like personal contact. And so we started, as most people do with our friends and family network, that only goes so far for most of us. Um, and in fact, you know, it, it's even, um, it's generally a small network, right? And, and a lot of people, especially when we started, a lot of our friends and family, they're not into real estate and they didn't understand what a multifamily syndication was. And so, there was a lot of education and it was a longer term play to warm up those types of individuals. And so we found ourselves going to networking events, uh, local meetups. We found um, other investing clubs that we could go to either in person or virtually, depending on, on what the situation was. We joined real estate groups that we could network with other people with. And so we really just got out and we took every opportunity we could to talk to people, right? People ask you, hey, what do you do? Well, I am financially free because I invest in real estate and people get intrigued. And so you start to talk to them about how you can, you know, invest passively in deals and make your money work for you. Um, I think similar a little bit to your story. A lot of people are locked into 401ks or other types of retirement accounts that are very shielded in terms of the investments that you can, you can do. And so real estate is not one of those. And so sometimes there's even, a uh, broader discussion that that can happen about how to take some or all of that money and put it into a self-directed account so that you can liberate it and use it um, as you want, be it real estate or precious metals or, or whatever, things like that. But, you know, our, our favorite way is really just getting out, meeting people, talking and um, adding them into an investor list and then educating them over time. And then when opportunities do come about, they're prepared and ready rather than a lot of times these deals need to close fairly quickly. And so there's not a lot of time to make these financial moves or to get yourself educated where you feel comfortable enough. And so it is a, for us anyway, there's a no like and trust factor that, that needs to be built up and, and that takes a bit of time. Sure. Well, one word that you said a moment ago, and that's a key word uh, in my way of going about raising capital, uh, and that is the word educate. Mm. So we have 47 individuals, private lenders, um, loaning us money on deals. And interestingly enough, Mike, not one of those 47 private lenders ever heard of private money, didn't know what it was. And so what did I do? I put on my <laughs> teacher hat. You remember my teacher hat, right? Yes, so I do. <laughs> I put on my teacher hat, my private money teacher, and I just started educating people in our own network, what private money is, how they can earn high rates of return safely and securely. Uh, and I would do it one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I, I also joined Business Networking International, 
<clears throat> so I got to tell my story, the short version of it every week. And, uh, and I also put on uh, what I call private lender events, uh, or luncheons and I, you know, invite 20 people and buy them lunch. I'd have my attorney there, my realtor, my CPA, my credibility team, if you will. And then I, you know, take 30 minutes, do a presentation on what private money is and, you know, how to get involved in that type of thing. So, you know, different, different ways of what I call getting the word out. But uh, you also said something that's so true, and that is your own network, uh, after a while, is going to run out. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I practice and teach as well how to grow your network very, very quickly. And you just mentioned uh, as well about joining some meetup groups, investment clubs, and et cetera. One thing that I hear new real estate investors or real estate investors that have never raised capital before um, they ask me how to start. And I tell them all the time, well, you got to start by owning the real estate between your ears before you actually start investing in real estate, which means you got to get your mindset, right? We're not chasing, begging, persuading. You know, when we used to borrow money from the banks, they made the rules, mm -hmm. any kind of institutional money, they set the interest rate, et cetera. But here in this world of private money, we are our own underwriters. We get to set the interest rate. We make the rules, the parameters. And so what advice would you, from your own experience, would you give to someone who's never raised capital before, and but they're wanting to? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe some mistakes you made along the way that you corrected along the way. Yeah, it's it's a great question because it, it is it, it can be daunting for a lot of people that get into this world of raising private money. And so I would say two aspects, one of which you touched on. But first, I would say really just get yourself educated. There's a language of investment that happens, whether you're in single family homes, as you do, or uh, larger multifamily deals. All, all of those are spoken about in a certain way. And I call it a language, right? There are um, financial terms that get used. There's just the deal structure itself. Um, there can be waterfall structures. It can get really complicated. But, you know, the best thing is is for if, if you're willing to get it, if, if you're ready and wanting to get into it, really, it's get yourself educated so that you can speak confidently and intelligently about different aspects of the business. It's also, you just mentioned as well, the majority of people haven't heard of these real estate deals, regardless of what they are, unless they've maybe seen on TV people doing, you know, these sexy flips or things like that. And so as best as you can simplify the language without oversimplifying the process or the investment, the better off you'll be in being able to explain it. And then, you know, you hit on a key tenant. It, it really is about educating and presenting potential investors with an opportunity. There's no you know, you don't want to come across desperate or chasing a deal or in need, really. It's about, can you serve that person with an investment they may have never come across again that's going to most probably yield better results than if they're just in a money market CD or if they're in an index fund or if they're, um, you know, subject to the gyrations of the stock market, which, you know, we just went through yesterday, in fact, um, elements like that. So I, I would really say those are the probably the two best first starting points is just, you know, get yourself familiar so that you can speak in a confident and intelligent way. And then when you approach conversations, approach it as adding value or helping that person and presenting them with an opportunity. And it's up to them whether they choose to take it or not. I mean, we don't want to apply any pressure on anybody to join a deal or not. Really, it's we want people to come in when they're ready at the time that they're ready and with the comfort level that they're um, ready and willing to come in. One thing you just said a second ago, you said you didn't want to come across desperate. Well, the reason you didn't want to come across desperate is because desperation's got a smell to it. It does. <laughs> you know, I tell people all the time, the worst time to be raising private money is when you need it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> when you need it. And, you know, some of our private lenders, uh, you mentioned, you know, it takes a while for them to come around and warm up to it. I mean, I've got some private lenders that heard me talking about private money and private lending three years before yeah. they actually, you know, started or they hadn't retired yet and they didn't have the, they didn't have the funds available. Well, let's switch gears uh, for a few minutes, Mike. Sure. Uh, you got, you got into flipping dirt. You are a dirt 
flipper. I'm a dirt flipper. <laughs> yes. So when did you get involved in this and why did you get involved in flipping dirt? And then we want to dissect your business model as to what that looks like. All right, let's do it. So you teased at the beginning of the show, 2016, uh, I spent decades working for um, large high-tech companies, top top five in the world, running their operations and supply chains, had you know regional roles, uh, traveled the world, was on the W-2 career track. Um, I had had the misfortune of sitting on the side of the table that was laying people off uh, fairly regularly. And in 2016, I found myself on the other side of the table and um, in, in the midst of a layoff. And so the, the role that I had, we were living in Dallas Fort Worth at the time and I was working for Microsoft and their headquarters is in Washington and they were moving their operations uh, unit um, was kind of scattered out across uh, the region and they were consolidating that up in Washington. Didn't want to move up there. So really kind of on the side had agreed with my boss that, Hey, if there's a, if there's a reduction in force or a layoff uh, coming, I'd be happy to be on the list. I'll take my severance and, and kind of move. Well, in that same summer, my wife actually her, she was working for a healthcare company. They also were relocating. They were based out of Fort Smith, Arkansas and had a Plano office that she worked in and, they decided to close that office and, and move things there. And we didn't want to move to Fort Smith, Arkansas either. So we both found ourselves out of work. And in our situation, we didn't have any other sources of income. We didn't have investments other than, you know, in the stock market, but we didn't have cash flowing investments like real estate, rental properties or anything like that. And so when that, when our jobs went away, our income went away. And, you know, thankfully we got severance packages. We had savings. We weren't really living paycheck to paycheck. So we had the ability to reflect on our situation. And, you know, my knee jerk was to get right back into the corporate uh, world. Uh, I had interviews with Apple and Amazon and Tesla and uh, all of those are West Coast based companies and um, and or they had units in towns that I didn't really want to go live in. And uh, I just really had a nagging, gnawing pit in my stomach about the thought of going back into working for someone else. What kind of company culture was I going to step into? Was I, I was already traveling about 50% of every month to visit different locations and um, just really wasn't living my best life or the life that I wanted to live. And so, you know, fortunately, we took a moment just to pause and to sit down and think about what did we want to do with the rest of our lives? And in that moment, we decided, let's uh, try something different. And as a precursor to all of this, I had been revisiting Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So it kind of awakened this concept of getting more on the cash flow side of the equation of the quadrant, as he calls it. And um, so I had been thinking about a few things. I'd been listening to podcasts like this that talk about great ways to invest and or start businesses. And I heard on two different podcasts, some other people that were doing land flipping. And they would talk about what kind of crazy returns they were getting, like triple digit, you know, two, three, four X their money on deals. And it sounded great. And so I had invested in some education and I hadn't used it, though, because I was all in in my corporate career. I was busy traveling. And when I wasn't traveling, I was, you know, working late at night and doing things. And so my wife and I decided to give that a go. And so we signed up for a mentor program, um, went to a boot camp, got some education, and we set ourselves a time and a money frame. So we said, you know, let's give ourselves 12 months to see if this worked. We were really skeptical if uh, we'd never really heard of this other than a few success stories. And um, we gave ourselves a budget of some seed capital to get our business up and going. And uh, we plunged in. And sure enough, uh, we did a few deals and the returns were amazing. And we had a bit of a, there, there's many different ways that we can get into uh, here in a bit on how you can go about flipping. But one of the primary ways that we leverage is we owner finance a lot of what we sell to. So if we were to sell you a piece of property, we'd agree on, hey, let's uh, make a $450 a month payment. We'll do that for 72 months. Uh, some people put interest on it. We don't typically work in interest. We, we do it a little bit differently. Um, and then over time, you stack enough of those up. Well, soon enough, we had all of our expenses covered. So we stopped having to dip into savings. Our next hurdle was replacing our old W-2 incomes. 
we got that hurdle. And then we started, just, we just kept scaling and growing our business. And, you know, it's, it's more quickly delivered us a lifestyle that we really envisioned way out in the future if we were ever going to get there. But um, we decided actually in that same year, we downsized, we sold our house and we decided to rent. We decided to move to Colorado from, from Texas to Colorado because we wanted to enjoy our life today and not save for retirement, get to 65, maybe be able to retire, maybe not, um, maybe be healthy enough to enjoy hiking and getting out in the mountains like we like to do. And, and so we did a lot of things in that, in that moment, but it really worked out, you know, for the best. And, um, it's been a, a, a wild ride and a great ride. <clears throat> so when you're, when you're flipping land, flipping dirt, um, are the, uh, is this land acreage or is it lots? Uh, what, what kind of dirt is it? Mm -hmm. So it can be anything. We focus in a little bit more on, on acreage, maybe five to 10 acres as our 80% of what we do. Uh, we do some smaller, we do some larger, but I would say our bread and butter is five to 10 acres. It is as simple as it sounds. It's really, as they say in real estate, you make your money on the buy. It is buying property at a certain percentage below what you know the market is selling for. So you do some comp analysis in whatever market or sub market you want to be in. You then go out and approach property owners and say, Hey, I'd like to buy your property for X amount. Or you can just say open-ended, Hey, I'm interested in buying your property. If you're ever interested in selling, reach out to me, start a negotiation. There's different ways to go about that piece of the process, but essentially you buy below market value so that, you know, immediately you could sell it in that next minute and make a margin on it. And, you know, we just have a formula that we follow. We don't typically buy properties above a certain percentage uh, of what uh, the comp is so that we know we have um, a decent margin in there that's worth our while. And um, yeah, it can be, it, it's vacant land and it, you know, a lot of people do it different ways. Like I said, we focus on acreage. Some people focus on residential lots. So they're buying, you know, a 10th of an acre or a quarter of an acre. Um, there's other people that do a little more value add to the property. So you can buy a hundred acres and divide it up into 25 acre parcels, or um, you can go full vertical on it. You can entitle it for a certain type of structure. You can then build that structure. You, people do build to rent. They do, you know, build to sell, or you can rezone things commercial. Uh, we don't typically mess with that. We just like a very simple business model. There's really fat, juicy margins in there. And uh, we just kind of stay in that zone. It's low touch. Uh, and so we, we keep the business model as simple as we can. We save the complexity for uh, commercial real estate deals. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So what's your favorite methods or method on locating these potential sellers? And how do you communicate with them? Mm -hmm. The way we do it is once we once we pick a market, and there are all different ways to pick a market, as you can imagine, when we started, uh, I'm super analytical, uh, just comes from my background and, and a little bit my personality. And we were looking at, you know, I had a spreadsheet and a matrix together. We'd look at a county and understand uh, how many how many parcels of land are there in there? Uh, what type of velocity of sales is happening? Does the county have a uh, really approachable electronic means of doing business? Uh, all these kind of things. And um, Today, we don't really do too much of that. We really just do more of a trial and error. We, we just get out into a market. It needs to have a decent amount of vacant land in it. Um, it can be remote. It can be a city. But once you've picked a market, you can identify the, the so the county knows who all the property owners are because they're collecting property taxes. And so they're the root source of all that information. You can either go to the county websites directly, and a lot of times they will have that information in most cases, you can't really download or extract that information very easily. So there are list service providers that work in the real estate world. It's not just vacant land. They support realtors and brokers, and there's all these um, data analytics that you can purchase lists of um, property owners. And so we, we subscribe to one of those. We can filter it out. We can say we want vacant land only. Even within vacant land, there's subcategories. If you want to go commercial vacant land or agriculture or residential or rural, there's there's different ways to filter that out. You can 
typically look for out of state owners, which are a lot of times more approachable because they're far away from their land. They may not be visiting it very often. It may become more of a burden to them because they're having to pay taxes on it every year. Maybe they inherited it and they just don't know what they want to do with it. So there's different ways to go about it. Once we get a list of those property owners that we want to then contact, the way we do it is a direct mail campaign. We usually just send them a letter. We will make them a specific offer. We'll say, hey, we'd love to buy your land. We're willing to make you an offer of $6,500 or $3,200 or something like that. Um, we give our um, we give a mailing address, we give an email address, phone number, however they want to get back to us. And so it's really a numbers game. Um, we, we fine tune our offers such that we get two, three, four percent of people responding to us that are interested to sell their property and, and, um, we'll do a deal. So that, that's in a nutshell, a little bit how we go about it. There's other people that do it different ways. They call or they text. Um, there's different methods to go out and reach those property owners. Sure. And on most of these, um, on most of this vacant land uh, that you buy, um, are you taking it down? And in, in other words, uh, it's your company or LLC or whatever mm -hmm. that's actually purchasing the property. Correct. Yeah, we have an LLC and we do all the the purchasing directly, and then we 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 sell it as as it's our own property. Got you. So. Uh, in most cases, how are you funding, uh, the purchases through your own money or private money or the sellers taking back a note with owner financing or mm -hmm. all the above? <laughs> it can be all of the above. We generally purchase with our own money. We have enough cash flow coming in that we're able to fund a lot of our deals. Sometimes we'll get a deal that's a bit bigger. Um, and, and we have in later in these latter years started exploring bigger and bigger properties. And so we're talking six and seven figures where we will leverage um, either institutional money. Uh, we haven't done a deal totally with private money, but the land business in particular is perfectly suited to use private money or any type of leverage because as I mentioned earlier, the returns on these deals are in most cases you're making, you know, you're double, triple, quadrupling your money on a deal. So, you know, a hundred to 200 percent ROI. Well, you can take on private money and pay somebody 15 percent return on theirs or 20 percent return even and um, still enjoy really healthy margins. They're getting an amazing return that they're not going to get anywhere else. And so it really suits itself to to be able to use that. We've also never lost money on a deal just because we buy them at a price that we know we're going to be able to to turn it around. And so the risk profile is, is super low on uh, anybody losing their money or not getting the return that they expected. And then when it comes to selling, what's your favorite way to find buyers? Are you offering owner? I think you mentioned you're offering mm -hmm. owner financing to your buyers. Where do you find your buyers? We, we use social media a lot. So we love the free platforms. Facebook has a great marketplace. They have buy sell groups. Um, Craigslist is another great place that people look for land. Zillow is, is great. There's a lot of people looking for land. Um, alternatively, there are some paid sites. So you can go to like land.com, landandfarm.com. Each state has their own land offshoot, I think. And uh, you typically have to buy a subscription. And in a lot of cases, you can buy a low package, premium package. We use those occasionally, but we have our most luck on the social platforms. Since we've been doing this for eight years now, we have a large um, email list that people that have been interested in land. And so we will also offer generally as a first look when we get a property, we'll offer our email list kind of a VIP um, access to, to deals that come. And uh, it's 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 a bit more controllable in that way uh, than relying on Facebook or somebody to change their policy uh, month to month where you can advertise land. You can advertise land. You know, I don't like to be at their mercy, but there are billions of people on the platform. And so it's it's a great way to, to reach a lot of eyeballs. Well, Mike, uh, you actually coach real estate investors uh, on the flipping dirt, flipping land business. Mm -hmm. So uh, let everybody know how they can learn about that. Yeah, you bet. We have a website, flippingdirt.us, where you can get a lot of information. We have a specific section on our coaching program. 
Um, but in general, yeah, we, we started, um, last year, really, we had a lot of people asking us how we do what we do, what we're doing. Could we help them get started? Uh, we had enough of that organically that we said, let's just put a formal program together. And so we have a structure where we walk people through the end to end process. We love getting our hands on. And the, the great thing about land is that it's so flexible. If you have time and no money, if you have no time and money, if you have time and money, there's different strategies to go about coming about it. And so we love to get in there, help people determine what the exact strategy that's going to work best for them and then walk them through the process. And we stay by their side for six months or more just to make sure things get up and running. Uh, it, it's, it's incredibly rewarding as I know you enjoy doing as well. When you can touch people's lives and really transform their quality of life, and liberate them into, you know, enjoying cash flow or big returns or, or getting things like that and open up the doors of freedom. Uh, there's nothing more rewarding than that. So we, we love buying and selling land, but more than anything, it's really transforming lives. So uh, it's, it's uh, been a great ride so far. So Mike's website is www.flippingdirt.us. Be sure and visit that website. He's got uh, information and uh and uh, strategies there for you to take a look at contact information and uh, reach out to Mike and his team and uh, explore the possibility of flipping some dirt. Mike parting comments, any final words of wisdom or advice? Gosh, you know, I, I don't uh, know exactly your audience, but for us, I mean, I can say I dreamed of doing something on my own for years or decades, not really uh, wasn't front and center in my mind because I got caught in the rat race. I got caught working a job that somebody else was paying me for. I got caught over leveraging myself, right? I had a mortgage, had car payments, had uh, in my early days, I had a lot of debt that I was able to get out of, fortunately, but I kind of trapped myself in a situation. But I would say for anybody out there, really, the biggest thing you can do is just start taking action, right? Like I mentioned earlier, get education. There's so many groups and so many ways to follow people like Jay. Follow You can follow us on our social accounts. Um, there are people out there talking about ways to get started. So if it's something that has, uh, you know, itched, uh, in your mind, just scratch that itch, take action, get started. There are so many different ways to go about doing it. Like I mentioned, if you have no time and money, money and no time or <laughs> whatever combination you can come up with, there are ways to get started. I would just say, don't wait, get started. Um, you know, it's, uh, life is gonna, life is short and, um, you really pays to take this action today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining me here on the show. Again, that URL is www.flippingdirt.us. Mike, God bless you. Jay, likewise. Thanks for having me on the show again. You got it, my friend. And there you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. So glad you decided to join us. If you happen to be listening on any of the podcast platforms, be sure and follow me so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe and click that bell so you don't miss out. I'll be looking forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Conner.